The first thing that I want to say to all of you is that what I'm getting ready to share today is actually a lot of what I have learned over the years from children. Children living in communities at incredible risk to disaster, as well as things that I've learned from children who are fighting to recover from major disasters, and I acknowledge them and I thank them, as well as my many collaborators and students who have worked on these projects over the years. So first, a question. Why are we here today talking about children and emergency management, given all the number of topics that we could be talking about today? First, I think one of the reasons we're here today talking about children is because children make up a quarter of the population of the United States. There are ne nearly 74 million young people living in the U.S. today. But children don't vote. Children don't participate in most of the organizations that are making decisions that have profound consequences for children's lives. And so their sheer numbers, but also their absence in terms of decision-making authority is one of the reasons that I think we're here today. But another reason that we're here today is because disasters oftentimes destroy the places where children live, where they study and go to school, and where they play. And so this is a really important topic, and I really appreciate you being a part of this conversation. So today, I'm going to organize my presentation into three parts. The first part, we're going to talk about progress that's been made in the area of children and disasters. During the second part, we're going to talk about some ongoing problems and challenges. And then in the third part, we're going to look at some possibilities. But first, I want to tell you a story. And to tell you this story, I'm going to have to take you back several years to August of 2005. And to tell you this story, I also need to introduce you to a little girl who was 11 years old at the time of Katrina. And Sierra is one of the children that Alice Fothergill, a fellow sociologist, and I followed for nearly a decade after the storm so that we could understand what Katrina meant in her life and how her recovery would unfold. But the first time that Alice and I met Sierra, weeks after Hurricane Katrina, she told us this. She said that for her, the sound of Hurricane Katrina was the sound of people screaming. And Sierra's experience in Hurricane Katrina was traumatic and life-threatening. The day before Katrina made landfall, Sierra went to work with her mother, who worked at a local hospital in New Orleans. And Katrina made landfall, and that hospital where Sierra and her mother had taken shelter from the storm suffered serious damage in the storm. The generators were in the basement of the hospital and they ultimately failed in the disaster. And Sierra and her mother spent four long days and three terrifying nights in that hospital. After four days, they were rescued by fellow survivors in a boat and they were taken to the Superdome, which is a so-called refuge of last resort. And they spent another day in the Superdome. And then after spending a day there, they then got in a van with other Katrina survivors and they joined the wave of hundreds of thousands of Katrina survivors who were scattered all across our United States. Sierra and her mother eventually landed about two hours to the west of New Orleans in the town of Lafayette, Louisiana, and they took shelter in another mass shelter there, the Cajun Dome, where they spent about a month after the storm. Years after the storm, when we asked Sierra to reflect on her experiences during that time, she said this, Sixth grade year was, I, I don't know, I was kind of angry and I didn't want to like be in anything or do anything and I was just very angry and I was mad because I wasn't with family and I, I was missing my aunt so much because I was living close to my aunt before Katrina. I was missing all my family and my friends and the people that were really close to me that loved me the most. Has there been progress since Hurricane Katrina? I am glad to stand before you today to say that, yes, there absolutely has been progress. 
A few years after Hurricane Katrina, a federally appointed commission, the National Commission on Children and Disasters, came together and they did a major study of children's preparedness, response, and recovery, where we were at as a nation, and they made recommendations about where we need to go. And one of the many important takeaways of that report was this. The unique needs of children must be more thoroughly integrated into planning and made a clear and distinct priority in all disaster management activities. Today, here we stand together in 2018, and it's hard to imagine a checklist of vulnerable populations or special needs populations that doesn't include children and youth on that list. And so we made progress in that regard. We also have a wide range of materials that are available that are targeted specifically for children and youth, for educators, for parents and caregivers, as well as for emergency managers that are about trying to help encourage preparedness when it comes to children and youth in disasters. On the scholarly end of the spectrum, we've also seen a real and dramatic increase in the number of publications that focus specifically on children in disasters. And in fact, over this decade alone, nearly half of all of the publications that focus on children in disasters have appeared in this decade alone. And what that has meant is that a lot of those materials that we now have are based on this important evidence. So there there has been real progress, but problems still remain. And so in order to think about the problems when it comes to children and disasters and vulnerability, I want you to think about this tree. And with the trunk of the tree is really the heart of the problem, that even though there's been progress, children remain among the most vulnerable populations to disasters in this nation and the world over. And by almost every account, the exposure that children are experiencing to disasters today and into the future is increasing. And so what this means is that children of today and children of the future, they are coming of age in a world that is drier and hotter and more subject to extreme weather events than at any other point. And this is going to continue to be the future. When disasters strike and children are affected by disasters, their vulnerability may be in terms of physical impacts. So children may experience death, injury, or illness in the face of disaster. They also may experience psychological or educational impacts. So children may be uh, subject to post-traumatic stress disorder. They may experience depression or anger. They also, when it comes to their schooling, may have delay, diminished educational attainment, or they may even drop out of school. If you think back to what Sierra said as she was thinking about her time after Katrina, she was angry, she was depressed, she was stressed because she was away from all the people that she loves in her life. And she also had a really hard time transitioning to a new school after Katrina. And she told us that for even months after the storm, that when she sat in her school classroom, she wasn't really able to listen. She wasn't really able to learn because she was so worried about the other things that were unfolding in her family and in her community and back home in New Orleans. And so these consequences are real. But in order to understand why children are vulnerable in disaster and which children are the ones who are most likely to suffer the most severe effects and the longest term consequences of disaster, that's where we have to move to the root of the tree. And we have to start thinking about what are the root causes of children's vulnerability if we're ever going to do something about it. And so when we talk about root causes of vulnerability, oftentimes we're talking about personal factors, but also contextual factors. And so what does that actually mean? When we talk about personal factors, oftentimes we're talking about characteristics of the child. How old is the child? But it's not age alone that makes a child vulnerable to disaster, because other than the youngest children, infants and very young children who may be completely dependent on adults, 
Most older children and adolescents also have capacities, and so when we think about their vulnerability, it's not just age alone, it's how does age intersect with other characteristics, like race and gender and social class status, ability, health, and so forth. But it's not just the child either, right? It's also about the characteristics of the broader environment where the child lives and goes to school, and so what is the child's family like? What's the social and cultural context like? The economic context? How is the natural environment and the built environment where the child lives? And so the big takeaway here when we think about the root causes of vulnerability, the thing to remember is that even though we put children on checklists of who are the vulnerable populations in disaster, which sort of seems static, right? Like you're a child or you're not a child. But when it comes to vulnerability, vulnerability is actually situational and dynamic. And so think of it like this. What if a child lives in a safe home, a brand new home that's been built to the highest codes and standards, but if every morning a child gets on a school bus and then they go to an old school building that's built of unreinforced masonry and it's located in earthquake country, which means that that school building might collapse when an earthquake happens. And so that child may not be vulnerable at home, but they may be vulnerable in another place. And so that's something we always have to keep in mind when we think about vulnerability. Now, because there are many, many different root causes or drivers of children's vulnerability, that also unfortunately means that there is no one simple, straightforward solution for what we might do to try to lower or reduce children's vulnerability. But the good news is that also means that there are many possibilities that are available to us when we think about moving forward as a nation to try to always focus on how do we reduce children's exposure to hazards, how do we reduce their vulnerability, and how do we ultimately build up their capacities and their strengths? What are the concrete steps that we might be able to take as an emergency management community together to do these things? And so I'd like to close today by offering what I think are five possibilities for moving us forward when it comes to reducing vulnerability and building capacity. So first and foremost, I think that we as a nation are in a place where we could commit together to say that we are going to ensure that every child in this nation attends a safe school. We require children to be in school. And when they don't show up for school, they get in trouble or their parents get in trouble. But we are not required to ensure that school buildings where we're requiring those children to show up are safe. But the good news is we have all of the knowledge that we need to make those school buildings safe. So we have examples, amazing examples, from international partners who are doing amazing work around the world in terms of school building safety, and we also have guidance in this nation to help us better prepare for disasters, to plan for recovery, and also to make sure that our school buildings are being built in a safe way or being retrofitted so that they are safe for children. Second possibility. We are ready and we can educate children about the risks that they face and also about the actions that they can take to reduce those risks. Sometimes there's a lot of questioning about whether we should actually be talking to children about risk. Is that going to worry children if we talk to them too much about it? But here's the reality. Risk is all around us. A disaster occurs somewhere, so, somewhere around the world every day. There's a disaster somewhere around the world. Risk is real. Risk is increasing. And research shows that when we don't talk to children about risks, it doesn't like go away. Instead, what children report is that actually makes them more anxious and more nervous when they don't have those conversations. And so we need to talk about risk, but also always accompany that conversation with what we can do about the risk. Third possibility, 
we need to make sure as we're educating children that we're also listening to and involving children in our emergency management activities. Sometimes when we think about education, we think about us as expert and children as receivers of knowledge. And But that's not actually right, that children are also creators of knowledge. And one way to actually make this concrete, to think about this, so for all the students who are here right now, think about if I said to you, hi, I know that you live in New Jersey and you are potentially vulnerable to hurricanes. So what I'd like you to do, everybody in here, take out your notebooks and I'm going to tell you the 10 things that you need to do so that you can be prepared for hurricanes. And then you write that down, right? Or I hope you write it down. But then imagine what this would look like if instead of me telling you what to do, if I passed out all these blank sheets of paper to all of you in this room, and I started with a question. And what if I started with this question? What is so important to you that if you lost that thing, that you, you feel like you couldn't live without it? Will you write that down on this piece of paper? All of a sudden, that sort of evacuation plan and hurricane go kit takes on a very different perspective, right? So we need to listen to children. And this idea of listening to children, this isn't a new idea. Nearly 30 years ago, the United Nations adopted the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and Article 12 of that, cha of that charter says that children have a right to be heard. They have a right to express themselves about issues that they confront in their lives. Right now, it's hard to think of more pressing issues that are confronting children's lives than hazards and disasters and school safety issues. And so children have a right to be heard, but it's also really important that we do more than just listen. We also really need to be thinking about how can we actively involve children in emergency management, in preparedness response and recovery activities. We found after Katrina that children helped in so many ways after that storm. They helped adults, they helped other children and youth, and they also did things to help themselves to recover after that disaster. So children can help, and children oftentimes express a desire to want to help, but sometimes we don't have outlets available to engage children and youth and to make sure they have that opportunity to be involved. Fourth possibility, I think that we need to go even further in terms of encouraging children's ingenuity and their creativity. Kids know things, and kids know how to do things. After the 2011 Christchurch earthquake sequence, thousands of young people showed up, and they wanted to help after that devastating disaster. And it was the youth, through the Student Volunteer Army, who developed through software and using Google Maps and other imagery, they were the ones who figured out how to organize as student volunteers and how to deploy so they could help with that disaster response and the ongoing recovery. We also need to make sure that as we're engaging in preparedness and response and recovery activities, that we are opening up spaces to allow children and youth to express themselves in creative ways. Because we know that this can be really important for children to be able to articulate what is happening in their lives and what they need to help them to process major events. Sierra, who you met at the beginning of this talk, she really struggled for a period of time after Katrina. And she ended up enrolling in a creative arts program where she had an opportunity to express herself through poetry. And as we interviewed her over the years after Katrina, one of the things that she told us was that those creative art programs were so important to her recovery. And so right now, I want to share with you one of the poems that she wrote as part of her recovery. Hey, you. Yeah, you, the one in the corner who teased me for being so quiet. Well, listen up. I've got something to say. I found the courage to stand up for myself. I found the words to show who I am. 
I found the voice to speak my thoughts, my fears, my dreams, myself. So you, yeah you, the one that scared me to be so quiet, pick up a pen, find who you are, let yourself be free through poetry. Mm -hmm. Fifth and final possibility that I want to share today is that we need to make sure that we're cultivating anchors, advocates, and strong institutions for children. Sierra recovered after this disaster, not just because of things she did herself or for herself. She also recovered because she had strong family anchors. She had advocates who were out in institutions who were working on behalf of children and children's needs. And so to end today, I want to ask you, what possibilities do you see when it comes to children and disasters and reducing vulnerability and building capacity? And what concrete steps are you ready to take? Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.